Reflection has a bad reputation for a handful of different reasons, but what if I told you there was a new kid on the block that could also do some pretty crazy things? Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, we're going to look at unsafe accessors and how they can compare to Reflection. Now, we're going to be walking through an example where we can start modifying and leveraging private members of a type, which we're not usually able to do unless we use Reflection. However, with unsafe accessors, we can do the same type of thing, which is very interesting. The syntax is a little bit more concise. And if you stick right to the end of this video, you'll see some interesting performance characteristics. If that sounds interesting, remember to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and start walking through this example. All right, on my screen right now, I have a bunch of reflection code, but I want to start by going through the type that we have a little bit down below. So I have this public class our type you can see on line 72. And then all of the members that we have inside of here are all marked as private or private static. And that includes the constructor. So technically, if we wanted to do really anything useful with this class, we kind of have to use reflection to do anything. This is just a contrived example. I'm not suggesting that you go write code like this by any means. I don't want you to take that as the, the lesson from this. Uh, certainly, if you needed to be able to call these methods, you would in fact try to make them public or internal so that you could access them. This is purely for the example of being able to set up a reflection scenario and then for unsafe accessor. So that's a total disclaimer. I don't want to see any comments about how this code is crappy because it's all private and you could change it because that's obviously the case. Everything we see here is going to be marked as private, like I said, including the constructor. What I want to be able to illustrate as well is that we have uh, private fields. And when we go to call these methods, they will also print out the private field value. So that'll be helpful later when we go to call these things and we want to prove that they're being executed. We'll be able to see this information go to the console. So from line four down to 22 is a pretty typical reflection code that we could go leverage to be able to go access the private fields and to call the private methods, things like that. So I'm going to walk through what this does, and then we're going to see the variation of this with unsafe accessors. So on line four through nine is where I'm going to create the instance of the type. I am using activator create instance. You can use constructor info or type invoke member to do a similar type of thing. But we need to make sure that when we're using reflection and we're dealing with private, that we have to have non-public binding flags or else the reflection will not be able to sort of see the thing that we're trying to access. And for constructors, because it's a non-static constructor, I need an instance and I need create instance as well with the binding flags. Then we just combine them all with an or. This next parameter is not used. And then 42 is going to be an array of objects. And 42 is the parameter that I'm passing in because we only have one parameter on our constructor. Again, from line 78 to 81 is our constructor here. On 78, we see this single integer being passed in. So scrolling back up, this 42 is the single parameter being passed in. And again, we're not using the last parameter here. So after line four through nine execute, we will have an instance of our type, which is awesome because now we can start to do some things with it. We are going to ask for the private fields value. So again, using reflection line 12 specifically is going to be getting that field info. Recall, we have to use non-public. You'll see that as I highlight non-public, Visual Studio is pointing out all the other spots. That's because everything we have on this type is private, so we will need that. And in this reflection example, I am only using the instance members, so you'll notice that I also have binding flags for instance across all of these. We can get the value once we have the field info, and we have to pass in the instance that we're dealing with. And then the next part here, I'm going to be setting that private field. So I'm setting it to 1337. And just to kind of think through how this object is changing as we run this code, I create it with a value of 42. I'm going to get that 42 back out. We'll print it and see it. Then I'm going to set that value to 1337. And that means when we go to line 20 through 22 here, when I get the method, private method, that will get us a method info. When we call it, we should be able to see that we print out 1337. 
And that's because if I scroll down here, line 88 through 91 is going to print out instance private and then the value of private field. So hopefully that all makes sense. Let's go give this a run and make sure that we see that output before we continue on to the unsafe accessors. Before moving on, this is just a quick reminder that I do have courses available on Dome Train. If you're interested in learning more about reflection, I've put together an entire reflection course that's just over five hours long that walks you through all of the basics about reflection as well as some more complicated scenarios. If we have a quick look at the curriculum, you can see that we start diving into what types are in programming languages, how we can find types, how we can work with different member information on those types, and that includes some fancy things like being able to set private read-only fields, which is pretty wild. I do cover more advanced topics like generics, performance analysis, and some things that are beyond reflection. Remember to check it out on Dome Train. Thanks, and back to the video. There we go. As we see in the output here, private field is 42, and that's coming from line 14. And again, that's because we initialized our value to 42 when we called the constructor, and that was through activator create instance. Then we end up seeing instance private 1337, and that's because we were able to update that private field with reflection. And then when we called private method, so line 22 where we're invoking it, that's where we end up getting that console write line where it's printing out 1337. So that all worked with reflection. But you already knew how reflection worked, right? You want to see the unsafe accessors. So let's go check out what those look like. On my screen right now, I have a bunch of unsafe accessors printed out here. This is going to be the syntax. We'll walk through it together. But essentially, you need an attribute that is called unsafe accessor. That attribute has an unsafe accessor kind. It's kind of like uh, binding flags, like almost but not quite the same. So we need to indicate the type of thing that we want to be dealing with. If we have a look through the different member types here, we can see a constructor and then we can see fields and methods. But you'll also notice there is a static flavor of those two things as well. We don't have events. We don't have properties here. But if you're familiar with reflection and typing and how properties and stuff work, you might already know that properties in C Sharp and .NET, they will essentially be just methods under the hood. There's nothing special about properties except for the fact that they get this consistent naming convention with get underscore the property name and set underscore the property name. Those just become methods in the end. If you want to work with properties, which we'll see in a little bit, this is where we're going to be using method or static method, depending on if it's a instance property or static property. So the constructor, let me put this back. The constructor here, you can see on line 44, we need to have extern static. And then our type is the return type when you call a constructor. And then we need to have the same arguments that we would have on our normal constructor. So in this case, it is just a single integer parameter being passed in. Then I give it the name private CTOR, but these names of the methods can be whatever you would like them to be. Next, if we go look at the fields, you can see that unsafe access or kind field. Now we're going to start to include a name of the field that we're interested in. And this just literally matches the name that we have in code. You'll also notice that we have extern static here. We have int and then get private field. That's just the name we're going to have. And we need to be able to pass in the instance of our type. Now, if we go a little bit lower, you can see that I have the same thing for the static private field, but I want to call out that I have a ref keyword here. And if I jump down to the bottom of my screen, you'll also see from line 67 to 69, I've done the same thing. So this one kind of looks like the private field one up here, but this one has a ref keyword. So both this one and on line 52, we see the ref keyword. One's for the static private field, the one's for the private field. We're going to see how this ref gets used because I think it's very interesting. It seems pretty powerful. We'll check that out in just a moment. We have the property as well. So recall that I said when we're dealing with properties, we need to have a get or set underscore. You'll also notice that the unsafe accessor kind is marked as method, and that's because properties are just methods. They do have a syntactic sugar to make it look a particular way, but truly, this is what they get mapped to. And then finally, these ones might seem obvious by this point, but they are marked as method and static method because they are a method and static method, as you might have guessed. Again, just important to note that we do need to pass in our type instance here. So we need to have for the non-static ones, 
we need to pass in the instance, but for the static ones, we still need this type here. You'll see when we go to call this that we will be passing in null, but we do need to have a type and a, basically a parameter for all of them, regardless of it being static or not. It's just that we don't pass in an instance on the static ones when we call it. So let's go check out the code for how the unsafe accessors actually work when we call them. Okay, so on my screen now I have commented out the reflection code, but I do want to highlight all of the code at the bottom of the screen, which is going to be using unsafe accessors. So you might notice that it's a little bit more concise. We don't have to do all the binding flags and things like that. So we are doing a couple of different things here, but it's still similar code. So to start things off, line 24, I am creating an instance. So we call private CTOR. Again, you can name this method whatever you want, and we pass in 42. But this means after line 24 executes, we have used an unsafe accessor to create an instance of the type. Line 24 is essentially the equivalent to line 4 through 9. That's pretty interesting. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's a lot more readable if you need to be doing this kind of thing. So that's awesome. If we go down to line 26 through 27, we're going to be getting the value from the private property off of the instance. So you'll notice I'm passing in the instance here. We get that value, we just write it out to the console. And then line 29 is something that we haven't seen quite yet, but this is where that ref keyword is coming back. We can see that I have a ref int reference to private field. So that's the name of the variable marked as ref and then equals ref keyword again, get set private field. Again, passing in the instance. So this might not be a familiar type of keyword that people uh, use on their regular programming, so not to worry. We will see how this is going to have an effect for us in just a moment. I do wanna show that line 31 and 32 is the exact same thing for the static private field. So we're just gonna print the static private one out, and then we're gonna call both of those methods. So private method, so line 34, where we pass in the instance, that is essentially the equivalent to line 20 through 22 functionally the same idea here. We're just repeating the same thing with the static private method. And you'll notice that on both line 35 for the static private method, I pass in a null and line 31 on the get set static private field, I also pass in a null. Recall, we needed to declare these things with the type, but when we call them, we're passing in null because they are static. Static things do not work on instances. They work on the type. The last little bit here I think is pretty cool, so we'll see how this works, but line 37, this reference to private field, I did name it as such because it is marked as ref, but we do have a truly a reference to the private field, so we can go set this variable to 1337, and when we call private method, we will see that we've updated the private field inside of the instance because it will print out 1337. We're not setting 1337 anywhere else. With that said, let's go run this code and see the output. Okay, starting things off, private property, printing out 42, that comes from line 27. So when we created this thing, we passed in a 42. Getting the private property, if I scroll down here, private property is right here. The bottom line 94, you can see that it's accessing the private field. So it's just getting for us 42 off of private field, then we print it to the console. Pretty simple on that one. Static private field, we did initialize the static private field to one, two, three, four, five, six on line 73 here. So if I scroll all the way back up, sorry for jumping around. When we go to get that on line 31 and print it on line 32, we're just printing out that value as it was initialized. Next up on line 34 and 35, we called both of those methods. So inside of them, we print out instance private 42 and then static private. Again, just printing out that static private field. And that's why you see basically these numbers repeated here. So just a heads up, instance private 42 and static private 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 come from calling those methods. The really interesting one, in my opinion, my favorite part of all of this is that reference to private field on line 37, we set to 1337. That way, when we call the private method again, it prints out 1337 instead of 42. So that should hopefully illustrate to you that we were able to update that field's value with the unsafe accessor. Now, unsafe accessors are not a complete replacement for reflection. So I do want to call that out. There are differences. So reflection, we can dynamically load types at runtime. 
start looking things up by their name and working them with them that way, you'll notice that if we think about how these unsafe accessors are defined, I need to know this type information at compile time. So that is an important difference that I want to call out. So if you're looking at this and going, oh man, I can't wait to replace all of my reflection code with this stuff. You can't quite do that depending on what your reflection code is doing. There are things like source generators that you could use to maybe help with some other reflection scenarios. But when we're dealing with unsafe accessors, again, you need to make sure that you have this type information at compile time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to even write the signatures for these things. So it kind of falls apart if you don't have that information at compile time. Now, I did mention that if you stayed right to the end of this video, we could look at some performance benchmarks. So when that video is ready, you can check it out right here. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.